Hey guys, John Lee Dumas here, founder and host of EO Fire, and you're listening to Bravepreneur Parents Academy with Balaji O. Welcome to Bravepreneur Parents Academy, where the world's most inspiring entrepreneurs reveal their most defining childhood moments and share their legacy for raising brave little heroes who will grow up to change the world. And now, he still reads comic books under the blanket at bedtime. Please welcome your host, best-selling author, award-winning speaker, and self-confessed geek dad, Balaji O. You know, like the hotel in Vegas? Yeah, no, that's really his name. Balaji Hey everybody, you're in for a treat today. This is Balaji O with the Bravepreneur Parents Academy. Today, we are taking a trip around the world with John and Joni of TheCourageVibe.com. They are adventurers. They are speakers. They are travel strategists. They volunteer everywhere around the world, consulting on travel, speaking to families like yours and mine about how we can make the leap. You will not believe the courageous journeys that these folks have been on. When they start to talk to talk about what they and their kids have done, you will want to pack up your backpack and go trekking right now. Let's get into the stories. I'm going to get out of the way. And without further ado, please help me welcome John and Jody. Welcome. Wow, we're happy to be here. What an awesome intro. Thank that was you. amazing. I can't <laughs> wait to meet this family. <laughs> I know, right? I simply read your bio. Folks, what is going on? Listen, you guys, a lot of us would say, are living the dream, that dream that we all talk about getting to tomorrow. I mean, who doesn't want to travel around the world with their family? We all say we want to do it. You guys actually did it. First of all, no disrespect, are you crazy? You went traveling with kids for an extended trip? Please tell me how this happened. Well, I have to start off and even make it dicier because we had one-way tickets to Australia with a two-night reservation and no plans after that. Oh, come on, John. <laughs> six, six continents, 24 countries, 85 cities over nine months, 60,000 miles. Serious? Yes, we, uh, we've been called crazy many times. Uh, so, actually, the dream to travel around the world was seeded about um, – well, when Riley was two, and he's 19 now, so 17 years ago, um, mm-hmm. I met a woman on a plane. She told me about the time that she took her teenagers or her preteens around the world in the 70s. So that's mm-hmm. before Internet, before any kind of way to do it. And I was mesmerized, and I said, all right, I don't know how I'm going to do it, um, but we're going to do this. And I remember looking at Riley, and I was um, running my own company at that point, and there wasn't huge cash flow. I remember looking at Riley, who was two, and said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll do it. I went home and told John, and he said, okay, let's do this. And I said, let's figure it out. And so that started conversations from that point on in our family around the what if. Um, What if we sold everything and traveled around the world? Where would we go? What would we do? Um, And it was just around the dinner table at moments of quiet with our family or just trying to bring up conversation. It was the what if conversations that seeded it and continued to cause it to grow. So in 2012, we all the stars aligned and the kids jumped in. They were ready to go. And we said, let's do this because if we don't do it now, we're not going to have an opportunity to do it with our kids. Um, so we jumped in and, as John said, bought one-way tickets to Australia and a couple nights lodging. And we knew that we would figure it out from there, and we did. We had a lot of – we've done it – spent a lot of time and did a lot of research, and Jody would bring home books. And so each one of us would pick four countries, and then we got a big IKEA map on the wall. And then we tried to map out where we wanted to go. And then um, because our flex, our schedule was so flexible, then we were able to take advantage of great places and great people and great trips. And pricing was um, very inexpensive. So it was, uh, we called it a, uh, a high adventure, low budget trip. Wow. I got so many questions. 
finances? How did you pay for this? Immunizations, health, weren't you concerned? Language barriers, what about the kids' school? Goodness, help me out, folks. I'm having anxiety attacks. I want to do this. This is like on my bucket list, but there's all these things that just mentally are in the way. So talk me off the ledge. Tell me how a regular Joe like me can actually do what you guys do. Yeah, okay. So those are all the same questions that I had um, to Karen on the plane. And so those were – so, and they're the questions we get all the time from people when we do presentations. So how, what, when, where. Um, let me start with um, school. So the kids did on- online school. Um, it was all self-study. We got um, – Riley, who was 16 at the time, was a junior in high school. He, we got from his school the programs that they would approve to give him credit for his junior year. So he proceeded to do all of his work online. Um, Allison was in fifth grade at the time, and so for her, um, it was a matter of keeping up with work, with the schoolwork, with math and reading. But in reality, their learning was from the road. It was from visiting the temples. It was from being out in the Sahara Desert and checking out the stars. It was from learning from the other people who were traveling. Um, That's where their greatest growth came from. When they came back, they were well ahead of their schoolmates um, in so many areas um, and so much farther ahead than they would have been had they sat for a year in school. So um, we're all about experiential learning, and that's what they got to do. Um, Vaccinations, that's a whole nother subject. Um, That was tricky. There's actually on our website, there's a whole – post about vaccinations um, because of the fact we didn't know particularly all the countries we were going to be in. It was a difficult thing. But in situations like this, um, we're, our family takes an optimistic approach, not a naive approach, but an optimistic one, one that says the answers will come to us when, when we're ready and when it's time for us to know. And not that we jump blindly into things because we did do research. But we also knew that this is what we were supposed to do, and we stepped out in faith and belief and what we call magic and miracles. Um, We were expecting magic and miracles, and magic and miracles appeared. So we spent a lot of time um, bringing those things in so that we stayed healthy, so that we – and we did things that were smart. And I don't mean to sound so naive like we – jumped and the net appeared and it's true the net does appear but we we just believed that it would work itself out and we believed that we would meet people and we did um we were guided the whole way through um and john can talk to you about finances so i have a uh, an insurance practice but the interesting thing is we set up a budget of 50 dollars a day per person not including transportation so we had Ended up with 26 different forms of transportation from planes, trains, automobiles. Uh, we bicycled through um, the at night in uh, Bangkok. Uh, we did elephants in Thailand. Uh, we did camels in, in Morocco. I mean, you name it, we did a hydrofoil across the Mediterranean. So 26 forms of transportation. At the end of the day, for six continents and 24 countries in nine months, we came in right at $72,000. So it ended up being $2,000 a month per person um, for nine months. And so our travel budget ended up being about $25,000. And the uh, the balance was I had the, I had a little black book that I would put the date, the city, and the exchange rate. And then I had this acronym THFEM for Transportation, Hotel, Food, Entertainment, Miscellaneous. And I just tracked all of our expenses and made it really, really easy. And so for $2,000 a month or about $137 a day all in, we traveled the world as a family. $2,000 a month. Per person. Per person. $137 a day. Yep. Six continents, 24 countries? Yep. Nine months. So who among you is the detail-oriented planner and who's the impulsive one? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is that a loaded question? Um, you know what? I think we all that, four had our different roles. Yeah, I think that we. I mean, we're adventurers at heart. I mean, even before this trip, 
me. Like, um, you could ask our friends. We're we're the family that that just is trying new things on a regular basis. We're both entrepreneurs, so I would say that we're both, um, you know, we're not risk adverse in that way. Um, and so we can tend to be both impulsive on different fronts. Um, for the planning aspect, I was the one that would plan and figure out, you know, here's, you know, the airfare or how we're getting to the next location. Um, but our our trip was low budget, high adventure because we all agreed before we left um, that we were willing to forego the luxury resorts and stay in hostels and homestays as much as possible so that we could, one, save money, stay out longer, um, and experience more local um, flavor and meet people right. locally. And so that's how we were able to do it. This was not a nine-month vacation because we really, one, couldn't afford that. But secondly, we didn't want that. We didn't want – that wasn't our goal is to hit all the hot spots um, and the resorts around the world. We really wanted to meet locals. We wanted to learn about culture. We wanted to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones, each individually. Um, we wanted to really get to know the world in a way that we can't get to know it as we sit in our home in Oregon. Um, and so as a family, we made all those agreements and we had those conversations before we left. Um, so that when we were on the trip, we all had agreement around how we were going to show up and how and what this trip was about for us. And really, that's what a lot of times when people ask us how we did it, um, there's so many details of, you know, booking and hotel versus hostels. How did you find volunteer stuff? Um, and all of that's really important. But what I have come and what our family has come to know is that the reason why we were so successful in our trip, why we believe we were so successful in our trip, it was because of those great conversations, those open conversations that we had as a family before we took the trip. It's the setting of the expectations. It's allowing the space for all of us to communicate in a, in a way that is loving, kind, and graceful to each other, meaning that when somebody came up with an idea, as far-fetched as it was, we all let that idea play around and bounce around to see if it was possible instead of shutting that down. And what I've found as because of those conversations that we've had as a family, so much more happened on the trip because we were open to those opportunities. And that doesn't have to just be when you're on a trip. That's everyday life. That's yeah. everyday life. It does. You don't have to go around the world to have those kind of quality conversations and to be open for those adventures because every day is an adventure regardless of where you're at. And so asking those questions about what we did and how we prepared for the trip, I, we could answer those all day long, and I'm absolutely willing to do it. But for those folks who are sitting there listening going, how do I get started? I would suggest how you get started is start having those conversations with your kids and your spouse and the people in your life, the what-if conversations. And don't shut anything out. Don't say no to anything because, because it is possible. And let them play and, and use their, use your kids' imaginations and play off of that because that's really what we did is we just left the table open for anybody to discuss and bring up any ideas. You know, my first reaction in, in, uh, would be, you know, like, well, no, we can't do that. But I learned to, uh, zip my lip and listen to it. And then we had fun with it. You know, there was a pretty good chance that, and from a, from a, preteen and a teenager's perspective, you know, why can't you do that? See, they have no, no limits. And so when I told, um, I was out in my driveway and the neighbor was walking by and we were about two weeks prior to the trip and she says, I just couldn't do that. And I said, well, of course you could do it. You just haven't got the brain space around it. And it's not that everybody needs to pack up, you know, we gave most everything away and, and leased our house and put what was, what was left in storage and then when we got back, uh, we ended up emptying the storage and gave about another third of that away. So our wow. our houses talk about a minimal, minimalistic uh, atmosphere around here. We have this sparse furniture and everything else because we're ready to go do something next. 
But we found that yes promotes yes and no promotes no. So Mm. if you keep saying, no, I can't do that, no, I can't do that, then the next time you have an opportunity, it's much easier to say no. And so when Riley jumped off a 50-foot cliff into the Blue Lagoon in, in um, off of Le Bon, um, there was no way I could do it. And I, I tried to jump off of a 20-foot cliff into the water and still couldn't do it. I was so upset with myself. And it was that was a, a game changer for me because I started saying yes. And we had some amazing yeses because of it. And I didn't get left out because it's, you know, if three are in and one is out long term, you know, you can get through it all, but it's not nearly as much fun as if everybody participates. And I'm, you know, we actually are three generations because I'm 67 and Jody's 45 and our kids are 19 and 14. So, um, but, um, you know, if they can't keep up with me, then that's not my problem. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing. I tell you, you guys know that I have two sons. They are currently eight and five years old, and they're always asking. They're so curious about the world. They want to go to Europe. They want to go to Australia. They want to go to Asia. They want to go to Nigeria, which is where I'm from, and they've never been yet. And I always tell them, maybe next year. Hmm. Maybe next year. And I've been telling them that for about three years in a row. (laughs) And my eight-year-old is like, Dad. Are we ever going to go anywhere? So I completely hear what you're saying, John, about when you say that no, it's easy to keep on saying no. The time is never perfect. So, I mean, I'm really motivated, but I want you guys, John and Jody, to maybe take us along with you for a little bit for some of these amazing experiences that you guys have gone through on your most recent trip. So could you maybe share what's the most beautiful city that you remember visiting <laughs> oh that's easy portofino italy really yes oh it's unbelievable it's, it's spelled exactly how it sounds mm. that's my favorite 24 hours because our in-laws had joined us for six weeks through europe so they kept the kids and and uh, we just spent a week in tuscany in a farmhouse um for 100 euros a night by the way so you can find those opportunities and then we got on a train and went up to Genoa, and the next day we were going to take the Bernita Express across the Alps into Zurich, and Jody put her hand on my shoulder and said, uh, Mom and Dad are taking the kids, and you and I are getting on a train, and we're going three train stops back and spend the night alone in Portofino. And I looked at her and I went, Really? <laughs> <laughs> so it, by the way, it was the most fantastic 24 hours of the whole trip. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. You know, that was for me. That was John. So I think that it all depends for me when we get asked what are our favorite places. I think for me it was the places that surprised me. Um, mm. I was surprised by um, how much I enjoyed Cambodia. We weren't planning on going to Cambodia, but we were so close. We figured why not go and mm. see Angkor Wat and all that. So I was really um, <clears throat> really fell in love with Cambodia and would love to go back to the areas around that. Um, I also really enjoyed Morocco. Um, really? And so there was there were places that weren't necessarily on our list because, as, as we mentioned, um, we bought one-way tickets to Australia, and we would then – we tried to figure out how we could hopscotch across the country, across the world, staying yeah. in the sun as much as possible. <laughs> I love and it. And staying in our budget. And so what that meant is that when we would meet people at hostels, they would tell us about different locations or different places, and we would go, okay, how about that? And we'd take a vote as a family. So um, Morocco was really – we loved Morocco. Um, And then Cambodia and Southeast Asia was – I was surprised to like them as much as as I did. So I definitely want to go back and explore more. The hard part is getting there, but once you're there, it's incredibly inexpensive. And so we were way under our budget, so we got to stack a bunch of money for when we got to Europe. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I got it. Man, a whole bunch of little, little strategies that I'd never have thought of. What were some of the maybe funnier moments that happened while you guys were on the road? Mm. I think my funniest moment was we were in the elephant village in – in uh, Thailand, eastern Thailand, and they, we'd just ridden the elephants for an hour, and we rode them into the river and played with them and just washed them and crawled all over them. And, wow. and then we came back, and they feed them sugar cane. And so while they're eating at one end, they're doing something else at the other. <laughs> and a school, and I'm always, I always jump in, so I walked over and barefoot in 
in shorts, um, walked over and grabbed this big scoop shovel. I'm out in the street picking up the elephant dropping. <laughs> a school bus goes by, and all the boys are on on the roof, and all the girls are on the main on the main floor of the bus. And the whole back of the bus was completely loaded with girls. And so as the school bus went by, I went in a dead run chasing the school bus with this big chump full of manure <laughs> and pretended that so I was going to throw it at them. And there was about 22 girls on the back of that bus just screaming their heads off. <laughs> oh, that's classic. That's classic. How about for you, Jody? Um, you know, we uh, we laugh a lot in our family because we one of our tenants is trying to really keep our sense of humor and even in the midst of tiredness and uh, frustration. And I was thinking back to our time in Morocco. We were taking a really um, like a midnight. It was like a two a.m. three thirty a.m. train from Fez back to um, Marrakesh. And um, so you know we were the only crazy white people in the train station at the time and. And we, the kids and I had started like taking pictures um, on our little point and shoot camera and we would make funny faces. And um, so we were laughing. And at one point, you know, John was standing there and he's, you know, still waking up and we asked him to make a funny face and he makes a funny face. And the way that the camera took the picture, it looked like we were using the morphing app on the iPad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the face because we had moved the camera in such a way, and it made us all laugh so hard and just full-on belly laugh. And so we're laughing hysterically. People are staring at us. And then um, we go out to get on the train, and so we're walking all the way, and it's pitch dark. And all of a sudden, um, out of nowhere comes a huge German Shepherd dog Mm. that is literally like, barking at us, flying at Riley and I. So here we are in the midst of laughing still about this picture. And next thing you know, we're in sheer panic because oh a dog is coming from nowhere. And it was it on was, a chain. It was a police dog. It was a police dog. Mm-hmm. Scared jo- Riley and I to death. Um, we got to <laughs> pinned ourselves to the train. So we went from immediate ha- hilarious laughing to sheer utter panic. Sure. Terror! Wow. And as we get into the, uh, as we get into like our little car, our little, we had a little private car so we could sleep. Um, the lights went out and it was like being at camp again, right? So all of a sudden we're like, we have to get some sleep, you guys. Everybody, it's time to sleep. And as soon as everything got quiet, somebody would start giggling, and then the whole, and then all four <laughs> of us would giggle, and then we get ourselves under control. We have to sleep. We have to sleep. And then sure enough, someone would start giggling. And, uh, you know, I think that was one of the moments that we still laugh about. Um, and John still tries to say that we were using the morphing <laughs> app when we took the picture. I look, we I look like morphed. the guy. I look like the guy on Goonies. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no, who is not with that guy? So those, you know, so those, but there were so many moments like that. And, again, it was, um, you know, we all, we were, John and I were the parents, but, Through that trip, we became travel partners with our kids. And as John mentioned, we all have our strengths. And we're four pretty strong people in our family. We're all um, leaders. Yeah, we're all leaders. And so it took some time to find that balance. And I think as um, you're talking about taking your boys um, on trips, it's, it's such an amazing it's such an amazing experience to watch what happens to your kids as parents, to watch what happens to your kids as they um, become curious and as they learn to interact with other people and other cultures um, and giving them time to consider what is what they who they want to be and how they want to show up. Um, and it's just an amazing thing to watch. And it was so incredibly special for John and I to watch both Allison and Riley step into who they are and, and continue to do that even after we got home, because the trip hasn't stopped since we got home. We may be in one central spot, but we have continued to grow and learn. And we've continued as a family to learn the tool, to use the tools we learn on the trip now in our everyday life, when we get stressed, when we get frustrated when we get hungry or tired, (laughs) all of those things. Um, So as you think about taking your boys 
on the trips, you'll find a whole new level of understanding and relationship with your kids that um, you could reach by staying home. But, you know, it's just an amazing experience. So we tell people, they're like, when should we travel with our kids? And, you know, we'd say, well, we've, we've always done some sort of traveling with our kids. But in this case, it was when they were old enough to carry their own backpack, right? Got it. Otherwise, you, as John says to a lot of people, otherwise you become the pack mule. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so want that. Everybody carries their own backpack. But um, I don't think there's any, I don't think it's ever too soon to get them out and teach them the skills of interacting with others in a safe way. Um, but yet using those skills because that's an incredible thing for them to learn, for them to just blossom into who they're supposed to be. The trip will work much better, and it doesn't have to be nine months. It can be two weeks or three weeks. We met a family in uh, Lima, Peru, who was – they own the most famous uh, bakery in Missoula, Montana, and they could take the month of June off. So they were – they'd flown down to Lima. They were going to go to Cusco and work in the orphanage for the month, but then they were going to see Machu Picchu and do the Inca Trail and all that other stuff in between. So, but the more buy-in you can get from your kids and the more ownership they can participate, because if you just say, you know what, we're going to Disneyland and your child is 15 and they go, well, I don't want to go to Disneyland, I want to stay with my friends, and then you drag them along, you're going to have a different experience than if they are helping you pre-plan and they get an agenda and you listen to them openly and honestly and you don't jump to conclusions and you and you work together and build an itinerary that everybody can live with so that when you get in those stressful moments, because in the nine months that we were gone and no matter what happened, not one person, I don't believe even ever thought I'm tired and I want to go home. It never came up. And you had a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> and a, and a preteen. So that's saying a lot. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing too, that I think for parents, a lot of times, I mean, I know for me, I, when my kids were little, I really wanted them to have this great deep relationship with each other. Um, one that would, that didn't require me to be in the middle of it. Um, do you know what I mean by that? It's like, I want them to have a relationship, not pinned to me, but because yeah. that they really like their, each other's company. And in the course of this trip, um, we got to watch that relationship between Riley and Alice and Blossom as well, because they were the only, you know, they were, they were all there was, right? They could Skype yeah. with their friends. They could do those things. But in reality, it was, they had to, you know, share beds every so often. They had to stay in the room together. They had to watch out for each other. And that solidified a, a relationship with them that I know is solid for the rest of their life. Um, now, I want to get into that a little bit, Jody, because uh, – and I want to hear the rest of your points, so please don't lose it. But I want to get into that because I have two siblings, myself, an older sister, a younger brother, and my sister and I, we, were, we are close in age, two years. So when we were young, we fought like cats and dogs. I mean, we couldn't share the back seat of a car. <laughs> Talk less of having to share a bed and being each other's only playmate for nine months did – Allie and Riley always have a very amicable, agreeable relationship. Did it morph and transform over the, the trip? How did that happen? Um, great question. So there's five years difference between Riley and Allison. And um, so, you know, they were they were definitely at different points in their lives, right? Of course, you know, when she's a baby, Riley's already um, in kindergarten and all of that. Um, but they did have a good relationship, but they had the typical squabbles. I mean, you know, the irritation, the little sibling wants to hang out with, you know, Allie wants to hang out with Riley, and he's like, right. leave me alone. I just want to be with my friends, you know, and vice versa. She's into stuff. So it was very, you know, I mean, I I have older siblings, too, and so I, I recognize that, like, oh, gosh, does it does she always have to be with me? Or, you know, and just the classic games that – siblings play on each other um so yes we definitely did it was it a volatile relationship between them no um but that's part of how again how as a family we've all agreed to operate like we don't use the i hate we have never say i hate you to anybody i mean that's just not even acceptable if you're frustrated there's other ways to express it um and other ways to talk about it 
that are more respectful and loving to each other. Um, so they didn't have a volatile relationship. I wouldn't say it was super strong. I mean, it was strong. So, but what I saw on the trip, again, going back to those conversations that we had before the trip, where we had to have those, like, okay, family, I think I would ask questions like, so we're all going to be in the same room together. There's going to be times that we're sharing, you know, one room with four bunk beds. What are we going to do if we get sick of each other and don't want to see each other anymore? What should we do? And then it was the discussion was open and we could all say, well, this is what I'm going to do or this is what I, you know. And so those conversations, so that when they happened, because there were lots of rooms we shared with four bunk beds that we all slept in. And when you're in that kind of a small space, um, there's no room for an elephant in the room. You have to deal with it. Um, and so we w- would go back and remind each other, remember when we said we would, if this ever happened, well, it's happening. And remember how we agreed that this is how we would handle it. Um, wow, and that. so because when you make a decision before the fact, then it's easy to go, well, I've already made this decision, so this is how I'm going to behave. And, again, this goes to the fact we had an 11- and a 16-year-old. Having those kind of conversations with a 5- and a 6-year-old is a much different conversation, right? But um, with an 11- and a 16-year-old, we were able to have those kind of more higher-level conversations about what-ifs. But definitely they became each other's best friends. Um, and to this day still are really close and love spending time together. And for me as a mom, and I know John, um, I can't speak for him, but as a mom, that is one of the biggest gifts out of the trip is to see their relationship with each other and knowing that it will last. But they decided, you know, as long as we're stuck with each other, we have an opportunity to either make the most of it or be miserable. Yeah. 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 And uh, so they chose the former. But the Riley was in a one of his first girlfriends was a really nice gal, but she had a, a relationship that wasn't positive with her brother and her father. And Riley came home one night. And he says, this this really this is really sad that the brother talks to the sister this way and I'm never going to let it happen. And he wow. ma- he made a conscious decision to step up his game and give Allison some grace because a little a sibling that's younger can be a real pain in the butt when you're a teenager. <laughs> and um, and so he really stepped it up, and I was and we're really proud of him. But the the trip, we just got closer. We were close before, but we just got closer and closer and closer as the trip went on. And it, it's because we hear from parents, there's no way I could spend six weeks with my child. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trip. You know, and something really stands out, John and Jody, it's the way both of you relate to the kids. Even before the trip started, it sounds like you talked to them as partners on this trip. You gave them input, the responsibility to uh, contribute to decision-making, to discuss these what-if scenarios without shutting particular options down. And I've got to admit, as a parent – when I talk to my kids like they're mature, the times when I'm on top of my game, I'm not always on top of my game. <laughs> but when I'm on top of my game, and I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and I give them credit. I talk to them like they're mature. They tend to respond in a much more mature fashion. I imagine that for parents, sometimes we find ourselves, whether because we're exhausted, we're stressed out, we don't have a lot of time, we find ourselves dictating the kids. And it sounds like both of you were able to get away from that, and that really gave a lot of positive results. Yes, we have done our share of dictating orders, though. So trust me, <laughs> we haven't always been. It ain't always it, pretty. No, it ain't always pretty. Um, but I guess, I guess it's, you know, it's true. I guess we just felt like um, even from a young age that having conversations with kids and and not um, responding to them instead of reacting um, is really it's one of a piece of advice somebody gave me when I was pregnant with Riley is respond, don't react. Um, and I grew up with a very reactive father and I love him dearly, but he still reacts. And if, 
he tends to jump to that. And I didn't want to do that because I knew as a child what that did to me when I had the reaction. It caused me to shut down and not not openly share what I was really feeling or thinking. And so we have practiced that. And trust me, we haven't always done it perfectly because um, our own emotional stuff jumped in the way. And it's easy to go to that space really like that we're used to, that we grew up with. Um, But we're also quick to apologize to our kids um, if we've messed it up (laughs) and I think by showing them and and they might tell you something different when you talk with them but um I think us being willing to apologize and say gosh we're still working this through ourselves and we're working on our own stuff so that we can be an example to you um and sharing those vulnerabilities with them opens the door for them to share their vulnerabilities with us um and I think that We've always tried to approach it that way. Again, we haven't always been perfect, but it's worked for us. Um, and I think it's an important thing for parents um, to to think about is what can you do? I mean, what can you do as a parent that will continue to open up the conversation with your kids at whatever age it is? Um, it can start from birth. I mean, just having those general, those conversations, I think are important. I think when, for me, um, after all these years of parenting, the more I keep my mouth shut, the better things are. <laughs> and so I just bite my lip and, you know, say, you know what, I probably contributed to this in some way, so I'm really sorry that you feel this way. And they're because they're not really in a mood to have advice. And because then when you start giving advice, it's all about your agenda, not theirs. And I think we need to be better listeners and uh, do a lot less talking and do a lot more listening. And I think we get farther ahead. Because I found that where I – I absolutely had to say my opinion because it was my agenda. It just didn't seem like it ever ended well. (laughs) And then there was an apology soon after. (laughs) You know, I've I've got to comment on a couple of things that you said. Jody, I can really uh, empathize with having a different parenting style. You know, I have – amazing parents. I I think I have the best parents in the world, (laughs) by the way. But one of the things that didn't happen very often, probably for a lot of us, is our parents did not apologize very often. In fact, I remember the one time that my father apologized to my sister and me, and it stands out. I must have been seven years old when it happened. It happened that one time, and I'm 39 now. I still remember that. So that's a really big deal. My wife and I have tried to, if we catch ourselves being in the wrong, to just go ahead and make that apology. So I agree with you. I think that does go a long way. And John, I really love what you shared there about listening because I've had the experience just within the last year of coaching my older son in soccer. And boy, it can't be easy to be coached by your dad because, I mean, you know how we guys are like this, maybe more so than the moms, but we guys sometimes can be hard on our sons, especially when there are other boys around. We, we, we want to be harder on our sons so they can be, you know, get tough and be resilient and all that sort of stuff. But it wasn't, he wasn't always receptive to me giving him a lecture or my advice. No matter how right I was, you know, it, it wasn't appropriate or effective, I should say, to give him that advice in front of his buddies. I had to learn that the hard way. And I've tried to adapt, and I've gotten much better results in adapting. So, you know, I I really resonate with uh, what you're saying. It's like my favorite saying with Abraham Lincoln, better to be a fool and keep your mouth shut than open your mouth and remove all doubt. (laughs) (laughs) Why is that, that Abraham Lincoln? uh, Being a parent is a a tricky thing, and, you know, it pushes all of our buttons, right? And um, I've just – I've, I've learned over the years um, that, you know, these the kids are brought into our life to be our teachers. And, you know, and I heard that when they were babies and I didn't quite understand it. And what I realized is that's exactly the point. And so when there's a button that's pushed that the kids do that pushes one of my buttons that causes me to, you know, go off on a tangent that I shouldn't go on, I realized that really it's not about them. It's about me and what I need to learn and what's what's behind it. Is it my ego behind it? Is it that I'm trying to 
look good to my friends um, or the people around me, but most of the, <laughs> but it always comes back to me. It always comes back to what am I supposed to learn from this, and how can I not um, let that be a trigger if it's not a positive trigger. So my kids are the biggest teachers to me um, that I've ever had. So one of the things that we've learned is, again, not to lose our sense of humor. And in reviewing your questions beforehand, one of Jody's answers was, what was it, frontal lobe decisions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's my greatest fear uh, with my kids um, yeah. as they grow up? And, and I yeah. put their frontal lobe decisions. <laughs> <laughs> because both of them will look, both of them will come up with some crazy uh, yeah. statement or they'll think that they can do this or that or whatever it is. And we know that there's no, they just, is not going to end well. And we look at each other and start <laughs> laughing and just go frontal lobe decisions. Well, and not that, a, <laughs> the frontal, we just, as a family, we have the conversation that your frontal lobe isn't fully developed till you're 25. So right. sometimes right. the reasoning factors of if I do this, the results in the end will be this. Um, it isn't quite laid out there all the way. And so sometimes in those moments of, yes, but I must do this, I must do this, and we're realizing the end outcome couldn't be good, we just have to kind of look at frontal lobe. So sometimes the frontal lobe isn't isn't fully developed, and we just have to let that develop in its time, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It, it makes a whole lot of sense. and. Sometimes I wonder if mine's all the way exactly. developed, some of the decisions. Are, are, are any of ours, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, refuse to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is great. Now, um, Jody alluded to this. We're going to have the pleasure of talking to both Riley and Allison later this month. So you guys have that treat to look forward to. We're going to kind of see what this world travel has been like from the kids' perspective. But before we let you guys go, I want to put you through the time capsule question, okay? So let's pretend, John and Jody, that it's 20 or 30 years from now. Riley and Allison are married. Don't freak out, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> they have, maybe even have their own little kids. What would you like to say to future Riley and future John about 2015, about why you embarked on this nine-month adventure across the world, about why you have been so much into leaping and take, living an adventurous life, why you've been so emphatic about volunteering and having an experiential education. Why did you make all these decisions? Let's talk to them right now. What would you say? Well, mine's pretty short and sweet. I would just definitely say enjoy the ride. Uh, be good to yourself, be good to everyone, listen and uh, love, and there is no limit to the number of hugs you can get. 30 years from now, I would tell them that when first, when I first saw both of them, I was in awe with them. And, and um I knew that they were going to do huge things, and my job was just to hopefully clear the path so that they could figure out what their superpowers are and that they could learn that. Um, and so I was thrilled to show them um, how leaping can bring them to those awarenesses faster than anything. And through the adventure – through the trip, um, putting them in, in front of people that were interesting and fascinating that would open their world helps them get to where they're supposed to be faster so that they can make the impact that they're designed and that they were created for. And so I was, I am thrilled, I'm thrilled to be their mom. I'm thrilled to be their partner on the journey. Um, and I have loved every minute of it, even the frustrating ones. Um, and I, and I love their grandkids and their wives and their husbands. <laughs> and I've been, I've been thinking about all their partners, their partners and their kids for years and imagining what amazing people they are because 
of it all. So if that makes sense, um, I just am thrilled to have been on the journey with them. So I want to, before we close, and I'm sure you've already thought of this, is um, if anybody's interested, they can start with getting on the couragevibe.com and looking at our trailer video on the trip. Excellent. Oh, you got a trailer. Oh, okay. Um, now, okay. Sorry, go ahead. This is great. Okay. The, uh, this, this is really great. So we're actually going to get a a look at some parts of your journey, it sounds like. Yes. You guys captured video. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I haven't seen that yet. I'm going to hop over to the website to check that out also. So, guys, you got the website. It's the Courage Vibe. Dot com. They've got a whole bunch of information on there. I'm interested, John and Jody, you guys have uh, some sort of courses. Can you share a little bit about what you're able to, uh, how you're able to help families who are intrigued by this concept but don't really know what steps to take next? Absolutely. So um, we are um, doing what we call taming travel tension, and there's part one and part two. <laughs> Love because it. what we've found is that a lot of people get a very tense when it comes to the idea of planning a family trip, whether it's for a week, a month, or a year. Um, and so Taming Travel Tension 1 is designed for those families who maybe are just doing a one- to four-week trip um, where we kind of go through, like, how to plan. And we talk a lot about the pre-trip conversations especially. But we also are talking about how to book deals and, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, the part two goes into those for those families who are saying, yes, we want to do a longer extended trip. Um, really, those conversations will cover, too, but it'll be deeper because it's about getting your whole family on board. Um, we'll talk about getting ready, what you need to do to get ready, what to do on the road, and then coming home, which seems to be a pretty big topic that isn't addressed a lot of times that is oh. something that um, I could spend, you know, a very long time talking about. But the coming home aspect is important to consider as you as you do extended trips, even on the short trips. Um, so, yes, Taming Travel Tension 1 and 2. And then we're also launching um, what we call Family Courage Journeys. And that is where we're actually on the trip with four to five families. Um, our first one is scheduled for the Dominican Republic. And in those trips, um, those families, with a lot of pre-trip planning and on the trip, will be giving them opportunities to live brave, give big, and have fun. Um, so we'll be doing volunteer work. We'll be doing some adrenaline stuff that kind of puts people outside of their comfort zone. Um, <laughs> living brave, giving big, and having fun. Um, lots of local opportunities to interact with the culture and learn and, and meet local people. Um, literally, it's about giving them tools to help them on their trip that then on the trip they're going to use. And then when they come home, they can still use those tools. So it's a fabulous trip, and it's going to be very fun. It will push buttons because that's what it's designed to do in a good, healthy way. It will expand yeah. everyone in the family, but bring you closer together as a family as well. So if you are intrigued with the amazing race and think that your family could do it, that's what this trip would be about, is an amazing race family. Wow. I'm intrigued with the amazing race. I don't know if my family could do it, but I'll tell you what, instead of saying no, I'm going to say yes. Yes, my family can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. And now, for, the courage, yeah. for the courage journeys, um, those have a, have an age, a minimum age, which is 10. So you've got a couple of years. Um, okay. But the other stuff, um, definitely taming travel tension is something that any family could use. And, and our definition of family is um, a loving, supportive circle of people, whether they're born, blended, or, and or chosen. So for us, family extends broadly. We don't have the classic definition of um, family, whatever the fam your family's made up of, is we accept, and it's fabulous. So, mm -hmm. love it, love it. This is amazing. Very, very exciting stuff. We're talking bucket list level stuff here. Uh, I I'm thrilled because your kids, Riley and Allison, they're doing stuff that people wait until they're retired to do. So now I'm like, okay, look, 
Jody and John have made this accessible. I'm about to talk to my wife when she gets home. We're going to start planning that. We're going to be taking that first class. I need to work some of this tension out, but it's going to be all good. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to ask some what-if questions, all right? I'll bring this up with my kids as well. And we're still a little young as a family uh, for the courage journey, but we can definitely take a little one-week one trip during spring break. Well, you're not too young to start talking about it. There you go. Those what if conversations, you're going to find where your boys ask him what they would do if they went to Europe. What do they want to see? Where do they want to go? Yeah. All of those things. Well, There's lots of what if questions. So I just have, I have this huge grin on my face because this is something I've wanted to do since I was their age. Mm. So we all had created a bucket list before we went, and then as soon as we went, we got to scratch things off. And when we got home, our bucket list was twice as long as it was before we left. Oh, wow, wow. Bigger and better. Bigger and better. So. Bigger and better. Awesome. This is amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Folks, we've been talking to John and Jody of the com. They are professional adventurers, <laughs> speakers, travel strategists. They're volunteering around the world, consulting on family, uh, on travel for families, and they'll help you relieve some of that travel tension. You can do it. I can do it. Let's start having those what if conversations. What an amazing, amazing conversation. Jody, John, thank you. Thank you. Thank this you. was it very was a, fun. It was a pleasure. And I told you you couldn't stop at 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault, John. You got started on those stories. <laughs> Guys, it's the Bravepreneur Parents Academy. We're having fun. Go check out thecouragevibe.com and shoot us an email. Let us know how those what-if conversations are going. Until tomorrow, up, up, and away! Woo! Thanks for supporting my dad's show. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to iTunes. He said hot chocolate is for closers. If you don't subscribe, I don't get hot chocolate. I love hot chocolate. Fear not. Although this chapter of Bravepreneur Parents Academy has come to its conclusion, we have many more adventures for you and your brave little heroes. Head over to BraveQuest.me for access to the Brave Quest Journal, an interactive activity playbook that rewards your little ones with points for accomplishing tasks that build character and unleash your child's inner superhero all before bedtime. We look forward to having you join us for more adventures next time on Bravepreneur Parents Academy.